Uh oh, watch what you say. Could be the plastics manufacturers are interfering with his internet connection. Um, Anne uh, has been emailing folks uh, because she's been having trouble too with her internet. So I wonder if it's like a network issue in Lansing. Um, yeah, a lot of our infrastructure seems to be <laughs> under some pressure these days. I hope tonight's attendance is not an indication of the level of political interest in the HVG group. Really? Can somebody sing a song or tell a joke? <laughs> well, I, I think next time you might want to consider offering virtual pizza for these meetings. <laughs> I I heard a pretty good I heard a pretty good joke. I hope this won't alienate anybody. Um you might think that people uh in the Middle East wouldn't have the cultural uh knowledge to find the humor um in the Flintstones, but I can assure you that the people of Abu Dhabi do. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and that falls in with this other joke that I heard. How can you tell when it's a dad joke? <laughs> the punchline is apparent. Uh Okay. Yeah, that was clearly a dad joke. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, we are recording, so you might want to say <laughs> such incriminating things on uh, audio. <laughs> all right, all right. <clears throat> well, we'll wait one more minute and we'll start at 7.35. Hi, Anya. And there's Tim. Hi, how's it going? Good. Okay. Hi, Tim. Okay, so I'm sorry about the delay, everybody. My internet keeps going in and out constantly, so it's been kind of a pain for me to get on the past couple of minutes or so. So I apologize. Hopefully, my hotspot will make everything okay and keep me connected. <laughs> okay. I told Christy we need to do about 10 minutes of business and then we'll launch into your uh, presentation, okay? Yep, sounds good. You're doing fine. All right, uh, let's begin. Hi, welcome to the Sierra Club here on Valley Group's monthly program for July, uh, coronavirus edition. Um, this is the Sierra Club here on Valley Group. I think everybody here is familiar. Uh, we believe in exploring, enjoying, and protecting the planet. I'm Danny Zekiel. I'm the chair of the executive committee. Um, let's please start with a moment of silence for those who are ill, have lost someone, or who live in fear of violence in their community, including police. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this is um, environmental justice is an issue that we're trying to come to terms with and to own our own privilege and the cost that our privilege causes others. And it's gonna be the, it's gonna be the subject of our meeting in September. Uh, we'll be meeting online and it'll be a joint meeting with the Crossroads Group and the Nepessing Group uh, to listen to Justin Onwenu um, an activist from Detroit uh, speaking about environmental justice. 
Uh, I want to thank Jamie, as always, for figuring out how to do these live streams on Blue Jeans. Um, if there's anybody who's not a member of the Sierra Club, we sure want you to join. And you join by going to sierraclub.org. When you join at the national level, which costs, I think, $15 a year for the first year, you've automatically joined at the local level to uh, by your address. Uh, Richard would probably like me to point out that tonight's the last night to apply uh, to run for our executive committee. Uh, the election is in December and, and your two-year term would start in January. And uh, maybe you, if you're a very late announcer, uh, you might want to you might want to talk to Richard there. Do you want do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I don't. Other than there's a 24-hour window for those people. <laughs> All right. I would like to share news about a big victory in our group's advocacy. As you might remember, the topic of last month's program was recycling. One of our guests was Brian Weiner from the Board of Recycle Ann Arbor. Uh, last night. The Ann Arbor City Council voted unanimously to sign a contract with local nonprofit Recycle Ann Arbor to repair and operate the Ann Arbor Materials Recovery Facility, or MRF, which has been broken down for four years and just being used as a transfer station. Right now, our recyclables are trucked uh, all the way to Ohio to be sorted. This is just great news. It will save the city hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, reduce carbon emissions, in Ann Arbor, but also across the region, as local communities will be able to start up their recycling programs again and utilize Ann Arbor's MRF. And it will bring up to 20 well paid union jobs. And I really need to give a shout out to Mike Garfield, the executive director of the Ecology Center. He has rallied our forces so many times in advocating for this at times when it just seemed absolutely hopeless. Um, and and the, the unanimous vote of Ann Arbor City Council, if you know anything about Ann Arbor City Council, <laughs> that's just a miracle. There are two uh, factions that both call themselves progressive Democrats, but they're bitter enemies and they never agree on anything and they take advantage of every little problem to, uh, to fight one another. And the <clears throat> fact that they could put that aside and support this, uh, the fact that Recycle Ann Arbor and the city uh, bureaucracy could work this contract out. It's a it's a 150 page contract. And there there have been some issues in the past between Recycle Ann Arbor and some of the city um, administration as well. So just marvelous work by lots of people, but but certainly led by Mike Garfield, who just never gave up and always persevered. Uh, <clears throat> that we could find a solution to this problem. So here's the part of the meeting where I usually ask you to get up and introduce yourself to someone you don't know. I'm wondering if there's a couple people that don't always attend that would like to introduce themselves or say why they came. I'm a teacher, don't make me call on you. <laughs> Donna, you want to say who you are? Um, so I'm Shonda Tome, and I've been active in some of the outings um, before COVID. And I'm here because I'm interested in the November election, um, and I want to make sure that I make good choices. Awesome, thank you. And, and we also have some royalty with us tonight. Mike, you want to say who you are? Sierra Club royalty. Are you, are you talking about me? Yeah. <laughs> Prince Michael. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, my reputation precedes me. Uh, uh, hey, everyone, this is Mike Berkowitz. Uh, I'm the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign representative for Michigan. Um, and uh, I used to work for the chapter um, back to 2011. Um, and uh, I live here in Ann Arbor with my partner, Megan. Um, we're kind of doing some other projects around the house, but we're excited to be here. and just kind of wanted to listen in um, on the presentation tonight and learn more about the 2020 election. Are you in your new house, Mike? 
So I'm in my my old house. I'm at 831 uh, West Huron right now, but we're uh, we're currently painting, uh, doing redoing the electrical, uh, gutters, you name it, on the new place. And uh, we'll officially move in actually after the primary. So we're voting at our current address. <laughs> what street is the new place on? We're on uh, Buena Vista. Uh, 235, it, it backs up right to Slauson Middle School, if you guys know it. Fabulous. I am a Slauson Golden Bear alumnus. Oh, very cool. Love it. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for joining us, Mike. And I want to say Jamie uh, is about to move into a new place also, so we have lots of, uh, lots of happy transitions in our group tonight. <clears throat> so... Uh, I want to tell you that next month's program meeting is going to be a real treat. Please come. And Jamie, we're going to have to do a better job of publicizing this next one. Um, this past May, we had a weekend when the bird migration through our area was the best in a decade or more. And two college age Ann Arbor brothers, Benjamin and Maddie Hack, set out to beat the record for the number of bird species seen in one day in Washtenaw County and the record stood at 141 species in one day in the county. Did, did the Hack Brothers see more birds than that? You'll have to come see their virtual presentation to find out. And that meeting will be right here on the same link at 7.30 mm -hmm. on Tuesday, August 18th. Um, I had the pleasure <clears throat> of speaking with them and setting this up, and th this is really gonna be fun. Um, as you know, our physical outings are currently shut down by edict of the National Sierra Club, as well as by common sense. Um, that doesn't stop you from going outside and enjoying summer and nature. And we're also having some virtual hikes called exercise guides, and they're advertised on our meetup.com page. And thanks to John Metzler for taking the lead in organizing this. Uh, we look forward to getting back to the real thing before too much longer. There are several new sections of the Border to Border Trail open, uh, and we'll explore them together when we can. Uh, by the way, a major source of funding for the Border to Border Trail is Washtenaw County's road millage, which is up for renewal in the August 4th primary election. 20% of the proceeds of the county road millage is dedicated to non-motorized trails, and HVG leadership has endorsed a yes vote on this millage. So if you haven't already voted in the August 4th primary, make sure to vote yes, please, on the uh, county road millage renewal. We have, our group has identified the election as our top priority for 2020. Uh, the leadership team have decided <clears throat> not to make endorsements in local elections below the level of state representative. We don't want to put any of our bandwidth into local wrangles where our own membership might be divided. Uh, we believe all environmentalists can agree on the need of removing the current president, as well as electing an environmentalist majority to the Michigan House of Representatives. And that's where we want to put all our effort, as well as the US Congress. And this is what Christy and Tim are going to be talking to us about tonight. Individual members of leadership are, of course, free to endorse locally, and some of us have done so but no candidate for an office lower than state rep should be claiming endorsement by the Huron Valley Group. We'd like to hear about it if you hear a local candidate claiming to have our endorsement so that we can ask them to stop. Um, I just have a little show and tell. We've been collecting uh, letters to so-called low pro propensity voters. Uh, the pile keeps the pile keeps growing. I can't really show you all of them, uh, and I don't have all of them. Uh, other members have hundreds that are still out, so this pile just keeps just keeps slowly growing. Uh, and the the National Sierra Club is having a letter writing campaign, and you can find about it at, at sierraclub.org. It used to be on Wednesday evenings, but I think they might have moved it to a weekend time, and it's like a virtual letter writing party, and they tell you all the what you need to do. Uh, does anybody else have an announcement or anything else they want to share before we get into our main presentation? Hold on. 
Well, it was. Well, here are our friends, Christy McGillibray and Tim Minotis from the Michigan chapter, and they can introduce themselves and make their own presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to draw your attention to the chat. I dropped three hyperlinks for the national volunteer opportunities that Dan mentioned. They're in the chat. And so, Dan, if you need to reference those and send them out to anyone who's interested, there's the letter writing link and then the texting and calling links for anyone who wants to get involved in that. So that's right there in the chat. Excellent. All right, now I'm gonna try and share my screen. Um, there we go. All right, can everyone see my screen? No. No. Oh, hmm. All right, I clicked on So click on share. share screen. And then it will give you a menu of apps that you wanna, there you go. There you go. Is it working? Well, yep. There you go. Okay, all right, we'll go to presentation mode. Um, all right, now I can't see any of you, so you'll have to interrupt me as I'm going. <laughs> so please feel free to interrupt me um, and we can answer questions afterwards. Um, so this presentation is um, about half of it is about our legislative program and then half of it is about our political program. Um, I think that most folks are probably more interested in the political work tonight, so, um, I'm going to work to go relatively quickly through the legislative stuff. All right, um, and so I should really quickly, I should say, um, my name is Christine McGillibray. I think that I, I've met or know almost all of you on the call. Um, I stepped into Mike Berkowitz's shoes, uh, which is a big deal um, given how his reputation precedes him, as he stated. And um, I work really closely with Tim Minotis, who is our legislative and political organizer. And so, so that everyone's aware, um, I'm on the independent expenditure side of our campaign work right now, which means I'm working really closely with some folks on the national side to do work that is not coordinated with any of the campaigns. And Tim is on the coordinated side, and he is working with all of our interns and directly with campaigns. Um, so if you are working and volunteering directly with a campaign, Tim is your person to talk to. All right. Um, and so, this presentation is gonna go over some of our really key legislative priorities and then how those are affected by our political program. And Christy, can I, I just say, uh, uh, the screen is frozen for me. So oh. I, can't, I can't tell um, what slides you are on. Okay. Um, as you're That's going through, possible. could you just direct me, and then I'll, I'll be able to talk talk to. Yeah. Them. So, so I have generally, what folks will do is they'll say next slide, and then the person who's advancing just reads the number of the slide. So, for example, it's on slide number three right now. Okay, that that'd be perfect. And Tim, so I'll I'll give you a cue. Like if I you know need you to talk about Senate Bill four thirty one or whatever, I'll let you know. Yep, sounds good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so this is um, this is the current makeup of our state legislature. Uh, we have a Democratic governor, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who I think a lot of you probably worked really hard to elect. Um, and then we have the state house and the state senate that are both controlled by Republicans right now. Um, we closed that margin of control, so it's 58 to 52 in the house and then 22 to 16 in the senate, um, which was uh, great. Um, it makes it much more difficult for the Republicans to put together veto-proof majorities, uh, but we are still dealing with a very anti-environment state legislature. So in the House of Representatives, um, we have what we consider uh, 45 good Democrats on our scorecard and seven neutral, and we have 56 bad Republicans and three neutral. And I, I think that some of you have probably heard our discussion about our new scorecard this year, uh, but we will include a link to it as well um, and direct anyone to it who would like to check it out. Uh, but we work to change how we actually score uh, legislators on their environmental records this year. Um, I think that, you know, as everyone knows, we're in a particularly watershed moment um, and we can't just wait to score legislators based on legislation that comes to a vote on the floor. We wanted to get at which legislators are really fighting the good fight. And so we decided to vote, uh, we decided to score uh, votes in committee, uh, public statements on issues that we really care about, and then sponsorship of bills. So those seven Democrats that got a neutral score 
they took public positions in support of Line 5. Um, the three neutral Republicans, um, they have taken positions in committees um, in support of usually energy legislation that we that we are backing. So that's how that broke down. Um, and again, we could go more into it, but I want to get to the political part of our presentation. We could spend quite some time talking about how that breaks down. All right, in uh, the Senate, uh, we have 15 good Democrats and one neutral Democrat. Again, that came down to a position on line five. Um, that neutral Democrat is Senator Adam Holgay. He's actually my state senator. And then uh, we have 21 bad Republicans and then one neutral Republican. Um, that is Senator Barrett. And again, he has been good on some of our energy issues. Um, senator Holier has been uh, a problem on a variety of issues, not just line five. Uh, he's advocated actually for the expansion of US, the U.S. Ecology Toxic Waste Dump. Um, and he's also been pushing a total deregulation um, at the local level of sand and gravel mining, among other things. Um, so he is definitely not a friend of the environment. And going into um, the, our next legislative scorecard, he might even wind up with a bad rating. So uh, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, um, so, so far since she's taken office, uh, she's directed MPART to regulate PFAS in drinking water. Um, a really important update there. Uh, there the Joint Commission, Co Commission, Committee on Administrative Rulemaking, JCAR, uh, which is the body that's overseeing the implementation um, of the PFAS MCL. That's the tool that's actually going to make it possible to regulate PFAS in water. Uh, they are going to be meeting tomorrow and taking testimony tomorrow. Um, we are going to be providing some written testimony to that from our national office. And uh, there, if, if we get to the end of session on Thursday without any interference from JCAR, then the PFAS MCL is actually going to mm -hmm. become law. Um, however, we're going to have to wait and see what happens tomorrow. Given that they are going to be taking testimony, it's totally possible that JCAR is going to mess with it. Um, but Governor Whitmer started that whole process, and we wouldn't be where we are without her leadership. Um, she's appointed Sierra Club members and staff to the state's Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Um, Justin Onwenu, our national EJ organizer, who is going to be addressing um, a joint group meeting in September, um, he is on that EJ Advisory Council. She's prioritized climate resiliency, energy efficiency, um, and a whole host of our issues, including agricultural runoff in her budgets. Um, she's directed the DNR and the Attorney General to review the legal status of Line 5. Um, full disclosure, she has backed away from a strong position on Line 5, uh, which is disappointing. And she, her office has indicated that they are going to not stand in the way of the oil tunnel under the Straits of Mackinac. So we need to keep continuing to put pressure on her there. Um, and she's also created uh, councils to really include all Michiganders. Next up, we have our Attorney General, Lena Nessel. She is easily our strongest advocate at the state level. Um, she's aggressively pursued legal action to shut down Line 5. Um, at times, she's even positioned herself in opposition to the governor. Um, she's sued the Trump administration multiple times. Uh, this is a photo of Dana Nessel at our award ceremony. And uh, this is probably where she was joking that she didn't want to leave office and think that she hadn't sued the Trump administration enough. So she's definitely got our best interests at heart. Um, and she did uh, what no attorney general has done thus far, and she's actually intervened um, in, in cases to actually support ratepayers um, when fighting back against DTE um, and also in their attempts to build a fracked gas plant. So. Um, she's really gone above and beyond and has stretched the limits of her office in order to support environmental advocacy. So uh, these individuals right here in front of you, uh, these are important committee chairs. And so uh, th these individuals matter because they can stop a good piece of legislation from ever seeing the light of day. Um, they are uh, appointed and elected from within their parties, and it's the party in control that gets to pick these committee chairs. So that is why party control becomes such a big deal when it comes to moving legislation that we care about. Um, so as you can see, we have pretty much across the board negative scores in energy committees, natural resources committees, and agricultural committees in both the Senate and the House. Um, the one exception being Gary Howell, who has a neutral score because he has been open to some of our legislation on energy. 
So uh, legislative updates, this is where I'm going to um, tap Tim to give you guys a quick update. Um, so Tim, first up, uh, we have the 100% clean energy bill. Um, would you like yeah. to give an update on that? Yep, I can do that. Um, so uh, those are House bills 5420, and then in the Senate side it is Senate Bill 763, is 100% by 2050 bill. And so this bill would require all of Michigan's utilities, um, energy generation um, to be renewable by 2050. Um, House Bill 5420 and its Senate counterpart would use our uh, renewable portfolio standard um, to require utilities um, to gradually increase renewable energy generation and storage um, in order to eliminate fossil fuel generation by 2050. Um, in this bill, there's also targets um, inside of it. So there are increasing targets in 2025. We have a 25% benchmark. And then uh, 2032, we need to be by 50 at 50%. Um, 2040 at 75%. And then at 2050, be at that 100% generation. Um, the Sierra Club, we were able to work with our, some of our partners at LCV and MEC um, with Representative Robbie on uh, getting 29 co-sponsors on the bill um, and really you know, whip up some support for this legislation. Whereas just last session, this bill was only able to garner one uh, co-sponsor. So it just shows that a lot more people are you know, open to, you know, uh, increasing our renewable energy standard they know is the environmentally right thing to do and also the economically right thing to do and so you know as we are moving forward you know this is becoming kind of a mainstream you know non you know controversial you know issue um, starting to um, as we are moving forward so that is uh, one really good bill and I believe if I'm remembering the slide next it's <laughs> no stricter than federal yeah Okay. Yep, and then um, after that's polluter pay, and I'll do polluter pay and water protection. So go first, no stricter than federal, Tim. Okay, perfect. So there is a bill. So just real quickly, a little history. Um, this this would repeal no stricter than federal. So back in 2018, um, during I think it was uh, late 2018 during lame duck legislature, um, the legislature passed a bill that made it so that we could no longer pass you know regulations and laws stricter than the federal standard so what this bill would simply do is repeal that um so we can restore our state's ability to address the many public health and environmental crises that michigan is currently facing um because we you know we are such a unique state that we simply can't just rely on the bare minimum federal requirements um, to protect our land, air, and water, and natural resources here in the state of Michigan. So it's crucial for us to have the opportunity to, to go beyond what is federally required by our, our, the federal government. So this would repeal that um, no stricter than federal law. And that is House Bill 4386. And so I'll push it off to you, Christy, for the, the last two then. Okay, great. Um, so the, the next, uh, chunk of bills that are up, the polluter pay bills, um, there's there bills that were, uh, there's one bill that essentially uh, returns or um, it's, it puts back in place, it put back in place uh, Michigan's original polluter pay law, which was overturned uh, by the Angler administration um, and really pushed at the behest of the Gelman Corporation, which I think a lot of you in Ann Arbor are probably familiar with. Um, they're responsible for the dioxane plume. Um, and that was back in 1995. Um, so what it would do is it would require polluters um, to clean up to the best of technical feasibility um, any legacy pollution that is a result of their uh, corporate malfeasance. Um, so right now they just have to quote unquote contain it, but they don't have to clean it up. And so um, that has resulted in the current threat to um, Ann Arbor's water supply from the Gelman Corporation. Uh, however, there's, you know, there's abandoned, thousands of abandoned toxic hotspots all over the state that are currently um, not being cleaned up. So that would require that. Um, the, the second package of bills there, there are a whole suite of uh, bills that were introduced by the House Democrats in February. Um, no stricter than federal is actually included in that package of bills. 
Uh, but what it would, what those package of bills would do is it would hold polluters uh, much more financially liable. It would require polluters um, to actually pay a certain percentage of their revenue. Um, and I think that that kicks in if they have uh, uh, um, income of over a million dollars a year. Um, it could hold uh, bad actor corporate CEOs uh, criminally liable for allowing um, toxic pollution associated with their business. Um, and it also uh, gets rid of the statute of limitations um, when it comes to uh, corporate pollution. So it would make it possible to go after uh, entities that polluted uh, soil and water um, and have you know, since closed down. So uh, this is uh, more pertinent than ever um, when we're seeing the types of budget shortfalls that we're seeing. Um, I think everyone has heard a lot about the fiscal crisis that our state government and our entire country is in right now. Um, now is not the time to be uh, repealing any more public health protections. And so it's more imperative than ever that we go after polluters to make them pay their fair share of cleaning up their mess. Um, so when this was first introduced, it was really supported by the environmental community. Uh, one thing that's an exciting new development is that there is a progressive revenue table at the state level where organizations um, from all different types of advocacy areas, including education and labor and good government organizations, are looking at ways that we can raise revenue for the state and change our state's fiscal policy to prioritize people over corporations. Um, and these polluter pay bills are um, on the top of everyone's list. So we are potentially already going to be hitting the ground running during next legislative cycle with a much broader coalition that's ready to see polluter pay um, enacted. So that's exciting. Um, the next, the water protection package. Um, this would put in much stronger uh, protections for our groundwater. It would put public trust in statute for groundwater. And what that would do is essentially would let us say no to um, Nestle water bottling operations and any other water takers that want to come in and pump as much groundwater as they want. Um, and it would close the bottled, bottled water loophole that currently allows water diversions out of the Great Lakes as long as those diversions are in containers of 5.7 gallons or less. And 5.7 gallons is the size of one of those water cooler bottles. So it's literally an exemption for bottled water bottlers that is currently in state law. And we want to close that loophole. Um, so those are all positive pieces of legislation. Those are all pieces of legislation that are introduced by our environmental champions on our scorecard. Um, and we are really grateful that we have worked hard to elect those environmental champions so that we have these um, benchmark pieces of legislation to fight for. All right, next up we have our negative legislation. Um, so Tim, I think this is all you. You get to talk about all the negative stuff. Uh, the first one is Senate Bill 431. Yes, and this is just an absolutely disastrous bill. And you know what it does, it, it makes it virtually impossible um, to, to deny aggregate mining permits um, if the applicant can show they'll make a profit. Um, it really allows for just unrestricted aggregate mining here in the in the state of Michigan. Um, you know, it, it does continue this no serious, uh, very serious consequence standard, but it creates a new and impractical definition guaranteeing that, you know, that standard will not be met. So this is a dangerous move, um, putting profit over the health and safety and welfare of our people and our environment. There are no environmental protections in this um, piece of legislation. And this legislation gives no consideration to how many other mining operations already exist within local communities. It does not provide sufficient safeguard for residents when proposed operations are situated in a residential area. And it precludes a municipality from negotiating important issues regarding haul routes or the ability to mitigate other negative impacts to the environment that create health hazards. Um, there are no requirements or opportunity to review the local impacts on you know, wells, for example. So this literally takes all local control away um, from for aggregate mining here in the state of Michigan. And what is so um, crazy and important about that and I want to highlight that is that aggregate mining, like other mining practices, is not regulated um, by EGLE. Um, so it's really regulated and the oversight is provided by the local units of government here in the state of Michigan. And this bill strips that away, which, again, 
would allow unrestricted, you know, unfettered uh, access to aggregate mining here in the state of Michigan. So it is a terrible bill. We've been fighting it really hard um, in the state legislature right now. Um, we've been able to slow it down. Um, before COVID, we thought we stopped it until at least lame duck, and then they are, have brought it back up um, during uh, the COVID uh, period um, because they are using it under the skies that it will save money on roads if we um, produce all the aggregate for our roads here in the state of Michigan, um, which is just you know not true. They also say there's an aggregate shortage here in the Michigan, which is not true at all. Um, this is based on a fraudulent study that um, the Auditor General found to be fraudulent. There are committee hearings on this. Um, the Senate Oversight Committee agreed with the Auditor General that the study was fraudulent and was influenced by industry. So, I mean, overall, this bill is just um, a disaster. And um, we're gonna keep, keep on continuing to fight it every you know, inch of the way um, to make sure it does not get passed. Um, the next bill is House Bill 4410, uh, I think. Yeah. Um, and that is, um, it reduces funding for non motorized transit. So, currently, non motorized transit um, is guaranteed to receive at least 1% of the money allocated um, from the Michigan Transportation Fund um, to the state trunk line fund and to counties, cities, and villages. So, um, this bill would allow the Michigan legislature to allocate less than 1% of this funding to non-motorized transit. And this fund is essential, if uh, this fund funds essential infrastructure for vulnerable roadway users like children, people with disabilities, seniors, and, you know, people who cannot afford the drive or, you know, people where, you know, we want people to get out of cars and finding other modes of transportation um, to reduce our um, carbon footprint. So, you know, for example, 76 of Michigan's 83 counties have, you know, one or more pedestrian motor vehicle crashes in 2018. So, you know, this is crucial for implementing, you know, Michigan's complete street laws and the over 100 local complete street policies that are across our state right now. And Christy, can you remind me on yeah. the last one? So next up is the uh, plastic bag bans and oh, okay. all that, all those shenanigans. Yeah. So you all uh, in the HVG Ann Arbor, you know, Washington County area should be familiar with this. Um, so HB 4500 would repeal the ban on banning plastic bags. Um, for years, um, local municipalities have been trying to do their part to, you know, combat plastic pollution by putting a ban or a tax on plastic bags, you know, which are big contributors to the problem of pollution in, in our Great Lakes and in our state. So, however, you know, based on uh, Washtenaw County back in 2016, um, you know, really trying to combat this problem, um, it really, you know, ticked off, you know, special interest groups and Republicans. So, in the final days of 2016, um, former Michigan Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly signed um, Senate Bill 853, I believe it was, um, which preempted local governments from banning plastic bags. And essentially what House Bill 45 does, I mean, not essentially, it just simply would reverse this ban. So to allow local municipalities that right to um, put bans back back on plastic bags. So it just reverses it. And um, next up is the bad bottle bill. Yes, okay. And we were fighting this bill tooth and nail and we're actually, you know, to, to stop it. Um, for the time being. So a lot of good work from our end and our partners end and a lot of different voices and our members and supporters really calling into legislative offices to raise some hell around this bill. Um, so that is House Bill 5423. Um, we call it the Bad Bottle Bill, um, which amends our state's unclaimed bottle deposit fund. So for those of you who aren't familiar what an unclaimed bottle deposit is, an unclaimed bottle deposit is, so you know when you go and you buy, let's say, a uh, 24-pack of Coke, you pay, when you go and buy that, you pay that 10, a 10 cent deposit on each of those cans up front. And when you decide to not return those cans back for the 10%, um, then that is what is called an unclaimed bottle deposit. And that 10 cents um, goes into our 
uh, Clean Up and Rede Development Fund here in the state of Michigan, um, which goes to cleaning up contaminated sites. Um, so under our current law, Eagle receives 75% of all claimed bottle deposits, which are directed towards the cleanup and redevelopment funds um, for contaminated site cleanup. And this proposed legislation would change um, the way that um, uh, unclaimed bottle deposits are divvied up and would take away much of the funding from Eagle for that contaminated site cleanup. So it would decrease Eagle's contaminated site cleanup funding by $21 million, which is just absolutely unacceptable, especially in a time when we have record number of contaminated sites here in the state of Michigan. Um, uh, next up, Tim, is the um, coastal zone hardening. Okay, so as you all have seen, we are having high water levels and erosion problems uh, along our shorelines. And, you know, there was just a bridge article showing, uh, explaining how armoring our shorelines right now um, to help prevent this issue is, is actually creating more erosion. Um, and for people who want to armor their, um, <clears throat> excuse me, want to armor their uh, shoreline on their property to, you know, protect against, you know, further erosion and having their homes or other um, structures falling into the lake, you know, they need to um, get a permit to have those constructions from Eagle. And so what this um, bill does, it eliminates the need for a permit for the construction of temporary erosion control structures um, along the Great Lakes um, when they are above a certain nominal um, level above sea level. So it would allow shoreline property owners to bypass state permit processes that ensure ecologically friendly and hydrologically sound um, shoreline uh, stabilization construction practices. And we, uh, Eagle is already rushing through permits and you know, it was just on a call with the Water Resources Division last week. And we're already, we're having some, they're seeing some major problems with this. People are not, um, um, getting the permits um, right now from Eagle and they're hiring out contractors to, you know, fill out some quasi half-assed plans and they are going ahead with these constructions right now without the approval from Eagle and are doing a lot of damage um, and really affecting our the uh, shoreline and the hydrological processes on the sh our shorelines here in Michigan. So we're already seeing the, the very problems that we knew were going to come, um, you know, from uh, the lack of, you know, permitting. And then obviously with COVID, you know, Eagle is really under resource, understaffed and not able to monitor and force really at this time. So, which is creating, you know, further problems and people just going ahead and constructing these things. So this is a really bad bill. We cannot get rid of the permitting process. Um, it's crucial in, you know, making sure our, our shorelines are, are stable. So um, this is a, another terrible bill that we were able to, to slow down. Um, but, you know, this problem of high water and erosion is not going to be going away anytime soon, especially with climate change. Nope. Thanks, Tim. Um... All right, next up. Uh, so you should all have on your screen right now uh, the bill tracker that we use for legislative updates. So uh, again, we can, uh, this is on our website as well. And if anyone would like it emailed to them, um, just email Tim and ask. Um, but this is regularly updated so you can see where not just these bills are, but all 156 bills are that we are currently tracking. Um, so this is a link to our scorecard. Um, so again, you can find this on our chapter website. Uh, this year, uh, and I don't think I mentioned it when I was quickly going through it, but we partnered with our friends Clean Water Action um, in part to, again, uh, lift up the real environmental champions um, that are fighting hard to make sure that we have the kind of benchmark legislation that we need to push the, push the debate and push the discussion on environmental issues in our state. Um, so how do we influence lawmakers? Um, I want to go through this relatively quickly because I want to get into the political, the political conversation. Um, nothing influences a legislator like watching someone lose an election. Um, so for, for the folks who are interested, we have another virtual lobby day coming up tomorrow, um, Plastic Free July. 
So check that out. Uh, Tim has sent out some great materials for that. Um, we have our in-district lobbyist teams. Uh, a lot of that work is happening right now virtually. Um, lawmakers are having virtual coffee hours. Obviously, we can still call their offices and we can take online actions. Um, and uh, taking control of the public conversation about this too, um, writing letters to local newspapers and getting involved in communications um, about environmental issues is a great way to uh, shift the conversation. Um, so we need to elect better lawmakers too, of course. Everyone has said that this is their main priority. Uh, obviously on the political and legislative team, we agree. Um, so we have endorsed candidates, um, we're educating the members and the public, and then we are making sure that Sierra Club members turn out and vote. Um, on the independent side, uh, we are making sure that voters that care about climate change vote. Um, so just for, for those of you that are interested, on the independent side, we are making sure that we are contacting voters that don't often vote, but we know that they really care about climate change. Those are the people that we're reaching out to, and we're contacting them in all the different ways that we normally would contact Sierra Club members too. Um, so I think it's already eight o'clock. I'm gonna keep going um, and go through some of these slides a little quickly so we can get to at least a few questions. Um, our internship program is up and running in a socially distanced world, which just speaks to the professionalism of Sarah Tresseter and Tim Minotis for getting it off the ground. It's a part of our coordinated work. Uh, so we have 30 interns that have been placed with endorsed campaigns. Um, they are working closely with those campaigns on socially distanced voter contact, and they're doing a great job. Um, so if you're interested in meeting any of them, uh, please email Sarah. She is the one who is overseeing that program directly. And I, I will just make one plug, um, you know, speaking, so our interns are, are working on a lot of our endorsed candidate races and, um, you know, for you all who want to get involved, maybe it's a phone banking event or some other kind of event, I'm, I'm working with National Sierra Club right now to um, get up uh, a mobilized page. So a lot of uh, campaigns are moving to what is called Mobilize, um, it's this website where you know, they put all their events that are going on, their, their phone banking events or other kind of virtual events that they are taking place. And so working with National to create a, a, a Michigan um, Sierra Club specific uh, mobilized page, which will have, um, you know, events and phone banking events for you all to, you know, go to, to look and see at and get involved um, in one easy, simple spot. So we're working to get that page up and running um relatively soon very soon um so just wanted to make that plug thanks tim um so just a quick outline of our electoral calendar um in june and july we have done uh pre-primary endorsements uh, we have a full list of our endorsed candidates so far up on our chapter website so again go refer to that um we have an election coming up the august 4th primary um, and we have done some um, endorsements uh, in some important races in the primary. And those are important because whoever wins the primary is going to wind up winning the general because we can you know, guarantee that either a Democrat or a Republican is going to win that seat. Um, so there are two in Detroit that we are particularly interested in. Uh, Donovan McKinney, he is running in House District 3. And Roslyn Ogburn, she's running in House District 9. Um, Donovan's running for an open seat. Um, however, one of his opponents is Sri Thanadar, who folks might remember from the 2018 gubernatorial primary. Um, Sri Thanadar has a terrible track record when it comes in to a variety of things as a businessman, but um, his facilities in New Jersey uh, abused animals. Um, and he's just got absolutely no indication, um, we've got no indication from his business record that he would be good on our issues. Um, and he moved to Detroit because he managed in the in the primary, he managed to win the most votes in Detroit. So he's decided to run for state house there instead of governor. Um, and Donovan McKinney, uh, to contrast, is an organizer with SEIU and as a part of that work, worked closely with Sierra Club at the Blue Green Alliance table. Um, he's also a member of the governor's Environmental Justice Action Task Force. Um, and he has fought really hard to stop water shutoffs in Detroit and make sure that water is safe and affordable in Detroit. So he's a really, it's really easy to throw our support uh, behind Donovan in that primary. And then Rosalind Ogburn in House District 9, um, she's a longtime uh, fair housing organizer. She's a Sierra Club member, um, and she's worked with our environmental justice team on environmental justice issues in Detroit. And she's running against Karen Whitsett, who some of you may remember 
um, is the Detroit state rep who has openly endorsed uh, Donald Trump. And she made national news headlines when she praised Donald Trump for touting the benefits of untested anti-malarial drugs to treat COVID. Um, so she was actually censured by the entire uh, caucus for her remarks. And um, she does have a good score on our scorecard. She hasn't actively voted against us on our most recent issues, but we have taken a stridently anti-Trump stand, of course, and her support of Donald Trump and the center of her caucus, uh, especially when she has someone so solid running against her, um, makes it easy for us to sink the resources that we are into Roslyn. So just FYI, those are some of the things happening in the primary. Um, in August and September, we are gonna make another round of endorsements after the primary for the general, um, and then Tuesday, November 3rd, the general election. Um, so before we get to the federal races, um, I just, I, for those of you that haven't been following the news, um, I, I wanna flag for most folks um, that the, the actions that we're seeing uh, from the Trump administration are incredibly concerning, especially when it comes um, to the Department of Homeland Security and the unidentified troops being deployed to cities all over the country. Um, Governor Whitmer has put out a statement about any um, federal operatives potentially coming to Detroit. And the news has been increasingly um, anxious about what is gonna happen between uh, Tuesday, November 3rd, and when the Electoral, Electoral College actually meets um, to officially pick the next president of the United States. Um, and you know, we've, we've said it a million times, uh, but it's looking more and more like Donald Trump will not give up office um, unless there is an absolute landslide vote against him. And that time, if it is if it is a close election, that time between the third and when the electoral college meets is gonna be filled with a lot of lawsuits and potentially a lot of unrest. So uh, I know, again, we've said it, everyone's working really hard, um, but this is really uh, the most uh, important election that we are gonna see for quite some time. Um, so on that note, uh, the federal races that we're involved in. Um, all right, I guess that was my my spiel. Um, I think that we are currently under the rule of an administration that does not respect the Constitution, um, the rule of law, and is increasingly giving signals that it is ready to turn militarized um, police and unidentified federal agents against its own civilians. So we've got to get rid of them. Uh, so in the in the Senate and the House, um, we have uh, in the Senate we have 45 Democrats, two Independents, and 53 Republicans. Um, in the House, we have 233 Democrats, uh, one Libertarian, Justin Amash, uh, from Grand Rapids, who is not seeking re-election to his congressional seat. Um, we have uh, 196 Republicans, and at the time we made the slide, there were five vacant seats, um, and I'm not sure if that's still the case. Uh, so we have a democratically controlled House and we have a Republican-controlled Senate, and that is part of the reason why we've seen um, a, lot of, a lot of stalemates on legislation that should be moving quickly given the state of emergency that we're in. Um, so, Tim, I know that you usually like to go into the details about folks that we've endorsed. Um, next up, uh, we have um, John Holdley running against Fred Upton in CD6. Would you like to talk about John Holdley? Yes, uh, absolutely. So um, this is congressional district. So there are three main congressional districts that, you know, as the Sierra Club, we, we are targeting um, in 2020. Um, two of them are, are protect and Alyssa Slotkin in CD8 and Haley Stevens in CD11. And then we're looking to pick up this seat, um, congressional district six, um, which encompasses um, Southwest Michigan. Um, you know, this is a likely um, Republican um, district, but, um, you know, as the few past election cycles, um, Democrats have been gaining ground in, in this seat. Um, for those of you who don't know Fred Upton, um, you know, he's a congressman since 1987. Um, he used to be more moderate on climate change, but has since backed off that stance and has become quite um, anti-environment. Um, I think uh, the Los Angeles Times um, actually named him as 
um, the worst thing for the United States' environment at one point. So that just tells you all you need to know about Fred Upton. Um, he has a 26% lifetime LCV score. Um, the Sierra Club, we anti-endorsed him as well. Um, and um, he currently has um, about $1.4 million of cash on hand right now. And, um, you know, the Democratic, um, his Democratic opponent, who we have endorsed, um, is John Holdley. Um, he's the current state representative from the 60th House District, which is Kalamazoo. Um, he is just, I, I, I could say a lot about John Holdley. He is just fantastic. Um, he's an environmental champion. Um, every year he has been in um, the state house, he has scored 100% on our legislative scorecards. So you know this is a guy that will be in our corner through and through on our priority issues. Um, he has about $438,000 of cash on hand right now. Um, he does have a Democratic challenger um, in Jen Richardson. Um, she's a, a teacher who teaches um, research science at uh, Kalamazoo Area Math and Science Center. I think that's what the name of it was called. And um, she currently has $22,000 cash on hand. Um, I mean, she's great, don't get me wrong, um, but she has no real realistic shot um, at winning the Democratic primary uh, in my eyes. Um, if you have $22,000, you're, you're not serious if you're running for Congress. Um, but John Holdley is our, is our candidate in that race. Um, you know, as I said, um, this race is trending more in our favor. Um, you know, with John's, uh, he's a hard campaigner. Um, with his experience being a state rep, he does have name recognition within the district. Um, he's fantastic on our issues. And, you know, with 2020 shaping up to hopefully be what we hope it to be, um, this could be a year um, that we flip this seat and remove Fred Upton um, from his seat in Congress and elect uh, environmental champion John Hoadley. Yay. All right. Um, next up, uh, Tim, if you want to keep going, we've got, you mentioned Alyssa Slotkin, um, but she's up. Yes, and I just looked at his 828. Um, I know we have until 830, so I will go, uh, <laughs> move, I will move through these. So um, our other races I mentioned is Congressional District 8, um, which is my home district, um, and Alyssa Slotkin. Um, she was able to finally flip this seat after decades of Republican control in 2018. Um, prior to her um, role as a Congresswoman, um, she was a former acting assistant secretary of defense um, for the international security affairs at, um, and uh, a CIA operative. Um, she's a third generation Michigander. Um, she understands the threat of climate change from a national security point of view. And, and during her first term, um, she has worked tirelessly um, for water infrastructure funding um, and overall has been laser focused on protecting the Great Lakes and mitigating climate change and expanding incentives for clean energy manufacturing, um, as well as leading on PFAS um, in Congress right now. And has really also been leading on democracy issues too that are you know very much so important to the work that we do here at the Sierra Club. Um, she's just fantastic. Um, she fits the district very well. Um, I think she, you know, um, you know, although this is still considered a pretty Republican area, um, I, I think she, you know, will pull this off again in 2020. Um, she has about $4.8 million of cash on hand right now. Um, she has four Republicans running in the Republican primary. I wouldn't say any of them are strong candidates, but again, this is a very marginal district. And if it wasn't for Ingham County in 2018, Alyssa would not have won this race. Um, in Oakland County, she lost pretty bad, um, but she was able to make up um, the votes in Ingham County. So um, this is still very much so a marginal seat. She's still gonna have to work her tail off to win it, no matter who the candidates are. Um, but uh, the, there are four Republicans running. Um, and I would say her biggest um, contender on the Republican side is uh, Paul Jung. If I think I'm pronouncing his name right now, um, he was a uh, Fox 47 television news anchor in Lansing, and um, he m most recently worked in the Trump administration at the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services to stop illegal immigration um, to secure our borders, I guess you could say. Um, so he's probably her biggest contender. 
Um, but again, I, you know, I'm very confident in Alyssa and um, retaining this seat in 2020. Fingers crossed. Um, next up, we've got Haley Stevens in District 11. Um, yes. That, that seat's trending even more blue. So that's yeah. a good sign. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is a district um, is one of the few in Michigan that actually trended in favor of Hillary Clinton um, instead of Donald Trump in 2016. Um, and is, you know, looked at as an important area to win for local, federal, and state races as well. Um, so it's a very important seat. Um, you know, Haley Stevens, um, you know, prior to being in Congress, um, she was the chief of, staff, uh, chief of staff of the auto task force um, inside the U.S. Treasury Department, um, you know, helping bring back 200,000 jobs um, here in the state of Michigan. Um, she absolutely understands the importance of protecting our pure Michigan environment. Um, and again, just like Alyssa, um, she hasn't wasted a second um, of her time during her first term here in Congress. Um, you know, she convened the first hearing on recycling policy in over a decade, um, has been fighting to improve the EPA and U.S. Geological Survey's PFAS de detection programs, um, has led a group of more than 100 lawmakers advocating for clean energy tax incentives, um, and has worked diligently to restore full funding to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And, she currently has uh, $3 million cash on hand. Um, she has three Republicans running in the Republican primary. Um, I wouldn't say, again, either of these are very strong contenders, um, considering the track record of Haley Stevens. Um, but nonetheless, um, it, it's, while it is still, uh, while it is trending blue and becoming more safe, um, she's still gonna have to campaign hard. And um, she's running against Eric Asaki, Asaki um, uh, Carmeletta Greco and Whitney Williams on the Republican uh, primary side. So one of those three will be facing uh, Haley Stevens um, come general election. All right, next up, uh, we've got Gary Peters versus yes. he usually must be named. Yes, so <laughs> Gary Peters, um, he is fantastic. I'm sure you all know that. Um, from securing funding to upgrade our water infrastructure in Flint to working on pipeline safety issues, um, you, know, you know, fighting for strong standards to regulate toxic PFAS chemicals, you know, has, his voice has been absolutely critical um, in standing up for clean, safe drinking water. Um, he's been also helping lead the way in driving clean energy technology, um, and including, you know, with electric vehicles. Um, as well as protecting our, our Great Lakes and, you know, the public health from uh, the dangers of climate change. So he is uh, definitely a champion of ours. You know, Gary is also a member of the Sierra Club. Um, he was the former um, political chair of our Southeast Michigan group a, a while back now. Um, so, you know, he has been involved with the Sierra Club and it has just been, you know, fantastic while uh, being in the Senate. Um, his challenger is John James, and some of you may remember him from 2018. Um, he's a Farmington Hills business exec and Iraq war veteran. Um, he ran against uh, Senator Stabenow in 2018, running again in 2020 against Senator Peters. Um, the Republican Party considers him a rising star within the party. Um, you know, he has about $9 million cash on hand. Um, Gary has about $12 million. This race is going to be tight. Um, Gary is going to need our help. Um, this is going to be a lot tighter and closer than we all um, would like. Um, so this is definitely a race to watch. And, you know, um, you know, Gary's going to need our help to, you know, push him over the finish line for sure come uh, November. All right. Um... Okay, we are down to state races, um, and I just want to do um, a check-in. Um, so, Dan, it's already 8.30. Um, I want to respect people's time. Uh, do you, would you like us to keep going? Would you like us to maybe come back and pick up where we left off and have more time to answer questions? What would you prefer? Well, how do, other, how do others feel? We are recording right now, so if you keep going, it's on record and we can post it and folks can watch it at their leisure. So my vote would be to keep going and get this all recorded and get it okay. up in one swoop. That'd be my suggestion. That sounds good. Okay. All right, we'll keep going. And if anyone else needs to hop off, that's understandable. We will work to keep it um, a little bit more succinct.
Um, so there are uh, 110 seats in the House of Representatives. Um, it's split right now. There are 52 likely uh, Republican districts. That's just not going to change because of gerrymandering. There are 47 likely Democratic districts. Again, our state is heavily gerrymandered as, as of this election. Um, that's changing, of course. And then we have 11 competitive districts. Um, Republican Party, but we think it's possible to, to win them. Um, so these are seats that we are going to protect. Uh, so it's House District 19, uh, Lori Pahutsky, she won with just 219 votes. Uh, House District 20, Matt Kolazar. House District 40, Mari Manugian. 41, Padma Koopa. 62, Jim Hadzma. And 71, Angela Whitwer. Um, so just to, to be clear on how these folks voted recently on a Line 5 resolution, um, there was recently a Line 5 resolution. Um, it was uh, it came up for a floor vote um, in at the very end of June, and um, only Lori Pahutsky, Matt Kolzar, and Padma Koopa uh, voted the right way. So I just want to lift those uh, three up in particular. Um, they took a hard vote and have been standing with us on absolutely all of our issues, even tough ones that come up within the party. Um, so our targeted races, uh, right now we have House District 38, um, House District 39, House District 45, um, 61. Um, 99 is on this list, although there is not a good candidate running in that seat. Um, so we're probably not going to be sinking any resources into it. Um, and then House District 104. Um, so Tim, would you like to give any background on these targeted races? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just go through them, you know, real quickly. So House District 38, um, this is a contested Democratic primary. Um, this is uh, an open seat. Um, it's currently held by Kathy Crawford, um, and she lost, I mean, she won by less than a percent um, in, in 2018 to um, Kelly Breen, um, who is running again um, in 2020. Um, we endorsed Kelly Breen for the uh, the Democratic primary in general, um, and um, so Kelly ran in 2018, narrowly lost by only 600 votes. Um, she does have a Dem challenger in Megan McAllister, who is also a strong candidate, um, who is you know the former chair of the Novi Democratic Club. Um, but uh, we went with Kelly Breen. Um, we endorsed her back in 2018. Um, she is someone who, you know, has a track record of, on the Novi City Council um, and is someone who we can count on to stand with us on our priority issues um, within the state legislature. And with it being in an open seat and her only losing by, you know, 600 votes, you know, in 2018, um, we think this is a seat that can absolutely be flipped and should be flipped um, in 2020. And then House District 39, um, yeah. we have Julia... Drew, Pulver, who is running against, um, she is unchallenged in, in the primary, so she will be running against um, Ryan Berman, who is the current incumbent. Um, Julia Pulver is a, an RN, um, and if some of you remember, maybe, um, Julia ran in 2018 for state senate in District 15, um, and ran a very strong campaign um, in a very uh, Republican district and only losing by a few percentage points. Um, this is a seat we feel like we, we should have definitely took um, in 2018. Um, if it wasn't for the Dem, can, uh, Dem candidate getting caught um, embezzling $100,000 from the Oakland County Treasury, um, hmm. she probably would have put, would have won and uh, we would have flipped this seat. But um, that all came out, um, I think, just like a month or two prior to the election and really sank her campaign for obvious reasons. So um, Julia is a really strong candidate, and we feel like she can really, um, you know, flip the seat in 2020. And then House District 61, uh, if you look at it, should, you know, historically has been, should be a Democratic seat. Um, this is an open seat. Um, Christine Morse is currently a uh, Kalamazoo County Commissioner. Um, we have not endorsed her or in this race yet, but it is one we are really looking at. Um, our Southwest Michigan group decided to not move on this race um, until after the primary, so we did not um, endorse yet, but um, we will be looking um, at it again um, come after the primary. Um, House District 104, um, 
Dan O'Neill. Um, he ran in 2018. Um, again, this he's a fantastic candidate who we can count on to be with us, you know, on our side, you know, on our priority issues. He narrowly lost by 300 votes in 2018 um, against Larry Inman, who, if you all remember, got brought up on you know, bribery charges. And, uh, you know, with that and it being an open seat and only losing by 300 votes in 2018, we think Dan has a really good shot at flipping this seat in 2020. Um, and then in House District 45, which is my home district in Rochester, um, that is two Democratic um, uh, primary candidates, um, Barb Annis and Brendan Johnson. Um, we went with and endorsed uh, Barb Ennis um, for the primary. You know, both seem to be very strong candidates and are hard campaigners and doing the right things. Um, the seat is typically, you know, a Republican district, but however, um, this is an area um, within Oakland County that is turning, you know, bluer and um, again, will be open um, in 2020. So this could be the year to flip the seat. Um, we decided to endorse uh, Barb over Brendan because her questionnaire was a lot stronger um, than Brendan's on water and especially line five. Um, you know, Brendan was open um, to a line five tunnel um, in his you know, questionnaire. So, you know, we, um, you know, that really caught some red flags for us. And, you know, Barb had a really, really strong questionnaire and he felt that um, she would be better for us on our issues. Again, they're both running great campaigns, strong candidates, hard campaigners. Um, so um, we will be supporting her, um, you know, in the primary and hopefully um, she will win and we'll get her onto the general and able to uh, flip the seat in 2020. I think we need to do another presentation that's just entirely about the politics of line five, <laughs> as we've mentioned it so many times in this presentation. Um, so uh, so here are some of those candidates that we mentioned. Um, so Kelly Breen and Megan McAllister, Julia Pulver, uh, Christine Morris, Dan O'Neill, Barbara Ness, and Brendan Johnson. So um, just so you can put some faces with those names that we just mentioned. Um, there's some more of their shining faces. Tim, you've already seen this, so it's okay that your screen's frozen. Um, so this this November and this August 4th, um, there is no reason absentee voting. Um, so if you have not already registered to vote absentee, the, the deadline was really July 20th. So um, you actually still can, but you just have to go into your city clerk's office and request your absentee ballot there in person. You can no longer do it online or through the mail. Um, we have straight ticket voting, which is back. Um, we have same day voter registration. So you can register to vote on election day when you go um, to the polls. Um, and there is online voter registration too. So uh, for the August 4th primary, um, you'll wanna actually uh, request that AV ballot in person. Um, but you can still uh, obviously keep encouraging people to register to vote online. Uh, it's migov slash vote. Really easy to get to. And Jocelyn Benson has made it easier than ever. Um, I am so glad that we all worked so hard in 2018 to elect the women that we did to run our state because Jocelyn Benson is really fighting hard for the integrity of our elections, which is more important than ever. Um, so how you can help, uh, I think everyone remembers um, I dropped three links to any of uh, the federal work um, for folks that are interested. I think that, uh, you know, Dan mentioned that the HBG is not focused on any local elections this year. So any of those, uh, those federal um, letter writing, uh, texting or phone banking efforts, um, please feel free to check out those links, get involved. Um, obviously, we cannot canvas right now, which is such a huge bummer because I think it's um, a really great opportunity to connect with people. Uh, but more people are picking up their phones. Um, so phone banking was kind of going out of style at the start of the election season and then COVID hit and now people are picking up their phones again. Um, text banking is also an option. Um, so we have sent uh, over 7 million texts on the national team um, and we are working to send a million more this month. Um, so please consider doing that. Uh, obviously, uh, donating to our PAC is important, um, so please make a donation if you have not already. You probably got our, appealer in, our appeal in the mail, um, and our, uh, all the money that you give to our local PAC, um, it goes to all of our local fights that we just outlined. Um, so please get involved if you haven't already. 
and all of our contact information is up there. Um, Tim, is there anything that you want to add? Yep, uh, just, uh, you know, what I mentioned earlier with Mobilize, you know, we have our interns on uh, targeted races, um, you know, at the state level, state house level and congressional level. And uh, like I said, we're, I'm working with national right now to get our, our mobilized site up to make it easy for you all to, you know, get involved um, with various different Sierra Club targeted races um, across the state. Um, really, really encourage. And so we'll have those events on there where our interns are working to put virtual uh, Sierra Club hosted and sponsored virtual events, Sierra Club hosted and sponsored phone banking events and postcard writing events. And we're gonna make sure all those events are up there on Mobilize. So, you know, on top of, you know, the, the national, um, you know, letter writing, phone banking, texting program, um, I encourage you all to also get involved, you know, at our state level races as well um, in those, uh, doing those particular things as well. So once we get that up and running, I'll make sure to share that with um, everybody, um, so you all can get plugged into those races and the work that our interns are doing and, um, you know, coordinating with the uh, campaigns on. Um, one quick mention, um, before COVID started, we had spoken with uh, political chairs from local groups, and I, I talked with Erica Ackerman at length a couple times about ways that we can make sure that we are involving local groups um, in our state chapter political work. Um, and so we had, you know, planned, uh, you know, a paddle for PAC dollars that is probably not going to happen because of the pandemic. Um, and obviously, uh, we are not doing nearly as many in-person events um, as we had hoped we would be doing. Um, but our local interns are still a great way to plug in to uh, chapter work. Um, so please uh, reach out to them and engage with them and get involved. And again, yeah, our contact information is up there. And if there are any particular races you want to get involved in or plugged into, um, please reach out um, to me. I'd be more than happy to uh, connect you all. Um, so uh, we have a last slide. I don't actually don't think this is the exact last slide, but um, just you know, a reminder of all the different ways um, that you can engage with your vote. Um, so registering, uh, voting for pro-environmental candidates at all different levels. Uh, make sure that you are aware of the positions that they are taking um, and you're supporting Sierra Club endorsed candidates, which I have no doubt you all are. Um, so just a few reminders as to why voting matters. I don't think we even need to tell this group. Um, so one single vote flipped control of Virginia's House of Delegates. Yusuf Rabi won his first election by two votes. Um, and John F. Kennedy won the presidential election of 1960 by a small margin as one vote per election district in 12 states. And uh, for those of you that don't know, Donald Trump's win number in Michigan in 2016, it was 10,704 votes, which is a um, infinitesimally small number. Uh, to give you an idea of how voter disenfranchisement um, can easily make up that margin of error, there were over 9,000 absentee ballots um, that are projected to be thrown out in Detroit because they will probably be received after election day. Um, so our, our engagement in election protection and getting out the vote is more important than ever. And, and the, the oh. fix that we're trying to pass, uh, 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 you actually Representative Robbie introduced a bill to help fight that. Um, so since you know we're all moving to absentee ballots um, because of COVID, um, he introduced a bill that would allow um, absentee ballots that were postmarked um, either the day of the election or prior to the election. And you know if they were received six days up until six days after the election, they must you know they must be counted. So we do have a bill um, that was introduced by Representative Robbie to help you know mitigate that issue. Probably, honestly, won't go anywhere, but, you know, it's a great bill, and um, just wanted to, to flag that for you all real quick. Great. I stopped sharing my screen. I don't know if folks are still on or if we were just recording for posterity. <laughs> quick, everyone hide. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, you guys, I hate doing these over Zoom because I really love to actually talk with people and engage. And I just feel like I'm talking at a wall. <laughs> so if you have any questions or if you wanna talk about any of the information that we presented, um, 
please let's have a chat if you're still on and you have any thoughts. Well, first of all, Nancy. Laura, thank you. I'm I'm wondering about um, what we're doing to support the post office. Um, I think that's another thing that's happening. It's it's underfunded now, and um, you know, pieces of mail are getting delayed. Um, yeah. And is there any? And there are you know there's it's part of the budget bill or it should be in Congress. Yeah. And, um, I just, hold on, let me see if I can find it. Um, the National Sierra Club just uh, intervened in a lawsuit in Pennsylvania that had to do with support for um, voting by mail. Um, but I'm not sure what else has happened at the national level. Um, other than uh, very clear, explicit support for voting by mail as an option and, you know, protection of the post office is an integral part of that. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I agree, Nancy. It is, it is really concerning, and I can check in with the national team to see if there is anyone uh, involved in support for the post office. Okay, thanks. Um, I do want to flag that uh, going into the election season before the pandemic, um, I had a long talk with uh, Rhonda Anderson and Justin about how the political program can more explicitly support EJ communities and building power for um, EJ issues. And uh, that's where Rhonda first flagged the need for election protection and the number of absentee ballots that have been thrown out um, in Detroit. Uh, and we see similar problems in other black cities in the state. Uh, so I don't know if folks saw, but there was a lawsuit filed. The ACLU uh, sued the city clerk in Flint because folks who have applied for their absentee ballots in Flint for the August primary haven't gotten them yet. Um, and Nayira Sharif, who's the director of Flint Rising, um, who's a water advocate, uh, she's one of the plaintiffs uh, named in the lawsuit. Uh, and so I've, you know, flagged that for National as well. Um, and uh, we, the part of National support in the Detroit primaries for the candidates that we're backing was a part of that conversation. Uh, but I think that the national political team uh, is, especially given the wave of uprisings that we've seen, um, you know, in May and June, uh, they, it, there's a recommitment to putting uh, money into election protection and supporting great environmental cam candidates in uh, majority black cities. So that's happening too. I guess I wanted to say um, we did make an endorsement in a in a local state house race for Felicia Brayback. Yeah. So she's in our area, uh, and I think Erica, correct me if I'm wrong. We're trying to we're trying to pull together an HBG fundraiser for Alyssa Slotkin. Uh, we're not too worried about uh, U.S. House District 12. Uh, turning Republican, so we thought we'd help help out with our with our neighbors. Um, and you know, thank you again for thank you again for bringing us all this information. I I have a comment uh, for Tim and Christy because you're young activists and you'll you'll be putting in decades of work after this. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I cut my political teeth on the Michigan bottle bill in 1976. Mm -hmm. Any of the rest of you work on that campaign, help abolish throwaways? Those were, those were glory days. Um, the, the very small infant environmental movement uh, was teamed up with Michigan United Conservation Co Clubs, uh, which is sort of the hunting, fishing lobby, and the Farm Bureau. And what a what a coalition that was! The bottlers, you know, advertised against the bottle bill strenuously, and and it still passed fairly overwhelmingly, as I recall. But over time, two lessons have come out of that that I wish we could go back in time and change the Michigan bottle law in two ways. One is uh, to index the deposit to inflation, 
10 cents was a lot of money in 1978 when this went into effect. I looked on an inflation calculator last year and 10 cents in 1978 was 38 cents last year. So you can imagine if you went got a six pack and you put over two bucks of deposit on it, you would be bringing those bottles back, right? Yep. Uh, <laughs> 10, 10, cent, 10, 10 cents is starting to be a little bit less significant. And I know people that just, uh, don't worry about don't worry about the deposits. I think they put the bottles in their recycling, but obviously you want to index uh, bottle deposits or plastic bag deposits or whatever it is to inflation. And then the other thing is we certainly should have uh, put the deposit on water, but nobody thought of it because in 1976 nobody could conceive of anybody paying money for a bottle of water. So, right. <laughs> right. Those. Are the those are the two big lessons learned uh, more than yeah. 40 years later. Well, you know, I appreciate that perspective, Dan, because I think that the coalition you just described, too, it was it would be really powerful now if we could get, uh, you know, Michigan United Conservation Clubs and the Farm Bureau on board with, for example, our legislation to uh, hold Nestle accountable. Um, we would have a real shot at it. Um, and, so, you know, a bit of a bit of history on the, the Nestle fight um, initially. Uh, we had uh, Trout Unlimited um, and Ducks Unlimited on board for the first round of Nestle fights back when the Great Lakes Compact was going through the state house, and those conservation voices were really important. Um, and so one of the, the current, um, you know, political realities is that building those coalitions is, you know, more difficult than ever. Uh, and so I think that, you know, hearing that anecdote from you is just a reminder that we uh, have to find ways to build up that that political power that's necessary to counter those corporate interests in Lansing. Um, and that's that's some long term work, but it's really important. It's really important. It's how you get big wins like that. So I got a email the other day from National asking uh, what we should do about the presidential endorsement. So my understanding is still at this point We've endorsed against Trump, but we haven't endorsed Biden. Is that correct? That is correct. There's actually going to be a town hall on Friday where staff are going to give input. Mm -hmm. Well, count me for uh, endorsing Biden strongly. Okay. Noted. Mm -hmm. Yep. I am just, I am filling in that straight ticket bubble myself. I just, holy cow. <laughs> Yep. He's not he's not perfect, but it's very much like what we were just talking about, that maybe we can build a really big coalition yeah. um, across the state and across the country and get some things done after the election. I think Steve's raising his hand. Yeah. Um, yeah, Christy and Tim, uh, thank you so much for spending your time with us. And uh, I have, um, you know, speaking of the Farm Bureau and Ducks Unlimited and Trout Unlimited, um, what are the prospects in the near term and long term for building more a bigger coalition against the uh, CAFO contamination of the Raisin River? You know, that's part of HVG territory here. It is. Um, I, I think the Farm Bureau is a lost cause on that one. Um, and, you know, CAFOs aren't my exact area of expertise. Um, uh, yeah, Tim, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. Um, well, I, I, this is not my area of expertise. I, I leave that up to uh, Gail and, and Pam Taylor uh, as our, our ag aficionados for, for the chapter. Um, I really lean on Pam uh, for that. But, you know, the Farm Bureau is one of the most powerful influences, you know, in the state of, state of Michigan. And, uh, you know, especially you know with a lot of those conservation groups down there they they have funneled a, a lot of money and resources into those local groups to really oppose the a lot of the things that you know we we support um and you know really combating you know algae bloom issues you know and other CAFO issues so really at the end of the day I, we're gonna have to get farmer support we're gonna have to go into you know these communities and really talk to farmers and really get these small farmers support you know behind the work that we do and we have to make a, a point of message that Sierra Club we are not anti farming by any means you know we we support regenerative farming but we're not anti farmer 
know, farming is, you know, the second biggest industry in the state of Michigan here. So we have to also fix that messaging and, you know, viewpoint that, you know, we're out here um, to, you know, stop farming or, or against farmers, because that is at the, the opposite of, you know, what we're trying to do here. So, you know, we're going to have to work with these local groups and partner with them, but it's also going to have to come down to the really, really local level of, you know, getting farmer support and going out to these farmers and talking to these farmers if we're really going to build that support um, um, against KFOs. Because right now they're all sitting in the, the pocket and sitting on the side of the Farm Bureau right now and has just been just a huge struggle to even move on that because they have such a powerful hold on farmers that these farmers just take Farm Bureau talking points and Farm Bureau direction where, you know, we're not able to, you know, get the things we want. So we're really going to have to take it to the real local level and start involving and reaching out to farmers. Yep. Do, you, do you have a list of farmers that are approachable? See, I'm I don't, that, that'd be Pam Taylor. I mean, if, if you want to listen, I would say, um, I don't know if you have Pam's contact information. If you don't, I'm more than happy to connect you with Pam, Steve. Um, but that'd be a Pam um, yeah. question there, to ask. There is a and, small farmers organization mm -hmm. um, that that is, you know, I think more on our side on some things. I, I don't remember the name of it. Obviously, Pam would know that or Gail. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Amanda Robert too, she was working to engage folks in um, the CAFO rewriting process, but I think it'll um, it'll take, uh, you know, time and relationship building, like Tim said, um, you know, showing up and getting to know people as, you know, real individuals and forming those relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, Steve, we have some farmers up here who might be helpful and we've gotten to know them through the Greenbelt process. Uh, the Farm Bureau initially opposed uh, purchase of development rights in Washtenaw County in 1998, but then uh, split, they, they their group split, and I don't think they endorsed on the Ann Arbor Greenbelt, and I actually know a number of traditional, traditional farmers, but who have had their development rights purchased and who know other farmers and might be people to talk with about starting to build some of those relationships. They're up here, they're not down there, but, you know, at least you get at least you get somebody that can speak the language. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's see. It's after nine o'clock. Any any concluding questions or comments that people want to make? No, um, thank you. Yeah. Let's thank our let's thank our guests again. You know, give them a hand. Thank you. Thank all of you. I think it's so hard to do this stuff remotely, and it's just you know it's such an important year. So thank you all for you know soldiering on, even though we're all far apart. Mm -hmm. And let's hope that three months from now, when we have our November program meeting, uh, that we'll be celebrating a lot of the fruits of of all your all's in our work. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm not thanks, relaxing everyone. until inauguration day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully by the hopefully by the November meeting we'll at least know who won. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> but that was my right. question: is when does the electoral college meet? Oh, you know what? I'd have to Google that. Um, do any of the Google it? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's in December. I think it's in December sometime. Um, they meet. Yeah. I don't think it's in November at all. If I remember 2016 correctly, they met in December, it's, but it's don't quote December. me 100%. So we'll have to, I have to get back to you, but if I remember uh, correctly. Okay, I'll Google it. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Bye.